In the New World's most anomalous slave society, though, the story's stranger. Unlike in the Caribbean, slavery in the southern United States didn't depend on imports. Slaves' birth rate exceeded their death rate, thanks to a milder climate and to an agricultural economy centered on tobacco and cotton rather than sugar. American slavery looked not just sustainable, but lucrative. Southern slaveholders began to argue not only that they were designing an alternative modern world, but that this was a more truly Christian model than the free North offered. Abolitionists could not quite believe it, but they were being challenged for the moral high ground. Now, this idea of a conscientious Christian argument for slavery now seems so obviously ridiculous that it's worth dwelling on for a minute. Pass over the secular arguments, you know, that, that slavery was a feature of a well-ordered hierarchical society, that it's more truly benevolent the, than the irresponsible anarchy of the free labor market in, in which laborers are thro thrown over as soon as they become unfit to work that it's a time-hallowed human institution which works with the grain of inherent racial difference, a lot on that. There's also a compelling biblical case that they make. The Bible never condemns slavery as such. It often regulates it. It implicitly condones it. True Christian slavery, white Southerners argued, doesn't reduce human beings to mere property. It treats slaves as a sacred trust, people over whom their owners have admittedly rather extensive rights, but for whom they have equally extensive responsibilities. Slave and slaveholder are bound together by bonds of mutual godly obligation. If Abraham had bought slaves, if St. Paul had sent a runaway slave back to his master, if Christ himself had never spoken a word against slavery, then who are these upstart prophets to proclaim an abolitionist gospel of their own invention? Well, the obvious retort was that this idealism bore no resemblance to the realities of American slavery. I even leave aside slavery's open cruelties and its racial basis. The lack of any legal status for slaves' marriages and the widespread laws prohibiting slaves from learning to read are both an acute embarrassment for Protestants. But abolitionists who turned gratefully from the general principle to these specifics found their argument dissolving in their hands. Southerners freely acknowledged that their system needed reform. They argued that the chief obstacle to reform was the dangerous discontent which abolitionist agitators were stirring up. If the abolitionists would only shut up, then the result could be a reformed, godly slavery, America's gift to the world. Many instinctively anti-slavery white Protestants felt the power of these arguments. If this was you, you might, for example, concede that slavery is tolerable in principle under some circumstances, simply very undesirable. But in that case, while you might press for emancipation, you've conceded that the matter is debatable. And in the American context, that means that you're likely to recognize each state's right to make its own rules. And you're not going to break Christian fellowship over the issue and you're not going to try and force the pace. It's the southern churches which break away from the northern ones, not vice versa. Unsurprisingly, black American Protestants found it rather easier to answer the pro-slavery arguments. They tended to focus not on textual niceties, but on the real evils which clustered around slavery like maggots. 